Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, do grandiose narcissists experience shame? I've also heard another related question, what happens if a narcissist experiences shame? So here I'll be looking really more at grandiose narcissism. So this type of narcissism is characterized by a sense of entitlement, self-centeredness, a need for admiration, having low agreeableness, but also arrogance, social boldness, a lot of confidence, superficial charm, being resistant to criticism, and being callous. We know that the other type of narcissism, vulnerable narcissism, tends to be characterized by shame and a number of other characteristics. But here again, I'm looking more at the grandiose side, where we don't really see shame as one of the signs. Now even when looking at just grandiose narcissism, we know that narcissism is really on a continuum. And we know that sometimes people who have grandiose traits manifest vulnerable traits at certain times. Right? So there's a fluctuation back and forth between grandiose and vulnerable. Now when talking about grandiose narcissism, of course, it's important to keep in mind that a grandiose narcissist can have moments of vulnerability, just like a vulnerable narcissist can have moments of grandiosity. So for the purpose of illustrating grandiose narcissism and shame, I'm really focusing on someone who is 100% grandiose or during the time that we're looking at them, they are 100% grandiose. So to understand how a grandiose narcissist would experience shame, let's first take a look at the idea of guilt versus shame and what happens in normal situations, so dealing with people who are not narcissistic. Well, guilt and shame are actually fairly straightforward. If somebody does something wrong, and they understand what they did was wrong, they experience guilt. And guilt moves them to try to fix the situation. So guilt is about the action, not about the person who engaged in the wrongdoing. If a person does something wrong and they feel that they're a bad person, they have a lot of self-judgment, that's shame. And we usually think of shame as being bad in terms of like a mental health counseling context. But actually, shame can lead to somebody being willing to fix the problem. It's through a different route than what we see with guilt. The mechanism is different. But either way, it can still lead to the same end result. The main difference is the person doesn't want to fix what they did because it was wrong. They want to fix it because they want the feeling of shame to go away. So correcting a wrong based on guilt is about a decision to be moral. With shame, it's about a decision to try to avoid pain. So what happens in normal situations when you're dealing with somebody who's not narcissistic? Well, it helps here to use a description of somebody engaging in wrongdoing, an example. Let's say that somebody works in an office building and there's a lot of different businesses in that office building. So a lot of people are coming and going all day from the office building, a lot of people driving in, parking their cars, getting out, doing whatever it is they need to do, getting back in their cars, leaving. So we see a lot of in and out, right? a lot of activity. Now some of the people work in the building, so they just drive in in the morning and they get out and they go into whatever business they work in, they stay there all day. But others have some business to conduct, like seeing one of the professionals in the building, delivering a package or something like that. So let's say that one of the office workers, I'm just going to refer to her as Lauren, drives to work. And when she's parking, she's backing in, and her rear bumper hits the door of the car in the space next to her and dents the door. So Lauren wasn't paying attention or her attention was focused on her other mirror, but either way it wasn't deliberate. She realizes that she hit the car, so she pulls up forward in the space and backs into it properly and then goes inside. Now remember, Lauren is not a narcissist. Now let's say it never occurs to Lauren to leave a note on the car or to take down the license plate number. So in her mind, she has to find the owner of the car. I'll call this car owner Sally. So Sally has the car that was damaged by Lauren. So when this accident happens, she doesn't know Sally is the owner of the car, but she clearly knows that the owner of the car is a human being, and the owner would not be pleased by the modification that Lauren made to the car, that dent in the door. Lauren is probably going to experience guilt. She realizes that it is inherently unfair to Sally to have her car damaged through no fault of Sally. Lauren doesn't feel like she's a bad person because she did what she did. She acknowledges that it wasn't her finest moment of demonstrating her parking skills. 
but it was just that moment. It was not how she drives all the time. So there's no history of behavior like this. So a number of different things can happen from this point on. Lauren, again, walks into where she works. She asks someone in the office who that car belongs to, and they say, oh, that car belongs to Sally. She works in the office upstairs. Lauren goes upstairs and meets Sally and agrees to pay the damage, or they both go out and look at the car and determine it's not a big enough dent to worry about, or whatever happens. But either way, Lauren takes responsibility, and she takes that responsibility in person with Sally. Now, another scenario. Sally doesn't work there, so she's one of the people that just kind of comes to the place and, again, maybe meets with a professional and leaves. So Lauren has difficulty finding her. She goes around some of the businesses. She can't locate the owner. And within an hour, Sally leaves, right? Her business there is concluded. She gets in her car and she drives off. And of course, again, there's no note or anything. So at this point, Lauren still considers herself responsible for the accident. But in her mind, there's not much more she can do, except to keep a lookout to see if Sally ever returns to the office building. Let's assume that Lauren called the police to report what happened, and they said there was really nothing they could do, right? So I think most of the time, of course, the police could do something. But again, let's just assume that that route didn't work out for Lauren. So she's left with really not much else to do. It's not like the expectation here would be that Lauren makes it her personal mission in life to find Sally and fix that door, right? It's not like she's going to put flyers all over town and say, hey, was your door damaged? Call this number. So guilt only propels somebody so far. And again, in this instance, Lauren has no shame. If she was experiencing shame this whole time, it may have pushed her to work harder to find Sally, or it may have pushed her into denying responsibility. She may look at it like the accident really wasn't her fault. So maybe she believes Sally parked her car too close to the line. Either way, whatever her reason is, denying that what happened was even wrong in the first place can help alleviate the pain of shame. There's other ways that Lauren could rationalize as well. She may think to herself that Sally saw the dent, but thought that it was no big deal. There were so many dents in Sally's car, she didn't even notice it didn't matter anyway. Or even if Sally noticed it and was upset about it, she immediately forgave the person who did it, which of course is Lauren, and didn't want to cause any trouble, right? So there's a way here for Lauren to make herself feel better by reducing the shame, even though it's not really logical. Now let's take a look at the same situation but here, Lauren is a grandiose narcissist. So we see the same circumstances here. Lauren hits this car, except now she really doesn't have any concerns about finding the owner. She looks around to make sure that nobody witnessed it. There's no video surveillance or anything else. And instead of pulling up and then backing into the space properly, she pulls into another spot, right? Because there may be paint on her bumper, and she doesn't want her car connected to the car that she damaged. So she would do something to avoid the consequences, but not really experience a lot of guilt, and really we would see no shame. So again, we're talking about grandiose narcissism here, but of course grandiose narcissism could also be on a continuum, not even necessarily moving down to vulnerable, but you could have somebody who's more grandiose. So here we don't really see hardly any shame at work, or maybe no shame, but what if we move up in terms of grandiose narcissism, move up that continuum closer to the most extreme grandiose narcissism that somebody could display. Well, moving up a little, we see in this case, Lauren hits the car, she pulls up, and she backs into the same space and doesn't worry about anything. She doesn't worry about getting caught. She doesn't worry about how Sally will react when she sees the dent. She isn't concerned that Sally may connect Lauren's car as the car that created the damage. Lauren's not going to worry about being confronted, but if she is confronted, she would just deny everything. So what if we took the level of grandiose narcissism to an even more extreme point? So in this situation, we see, again, no shame. But the shame dynamic does come into play, but in a surprising way. So at the extreme level of grandiose narcissism, we might see a situation where Lauren hits the car, backs into the space, and then goes looking for Sally. Not to apologize or try to make things right, but to cause shame for Sally. Lauren wants to tell Sally that Sally's car was parked too close to the line, that she had no business parking there anyway, that she didn't park straight, and that's what caused Lauren to hit her car. Lauren wants to find Sally so she can blame Sally, make Sally feel a sense of shame, really, for even existing. Now, again, we do see this with extreme grandiose narcissism, but it is hard to understand. I think a number of people, 
whether they're narcissistic or not, can understand how some people may feel in this situation that they really can't be bothered with things like this, that they somehow have the right just to ignore the damage they caused to Sally's car. We see examples of people being rude and inconsiderate all the time. That doesn't mean that they all have extreme grandiose narcissism. But in a situation where the offender tries to track down the victim to cause shame in them, this just seems really hard to imagine. It just seems so extreme. So I was trying to think of a way to explain this with a fictional scenario. So as I thought about for a while, this is what came to mind. So I live in the United States, in the state of Delaware, and here we have these rabbits that are fairly common, called eastern cottontails. They're like a brownish-gray rabbit. So imagine if these rabbits, these bunnies, without changing in any way, started to buy and drive cars. Now we have to suspend disbelief for a moment because, again, the bunnies haven't changed. They're not like sentient bunnies. They're not alien bunnies. They're just regular eastern cottontails that have added driving to their list of preferred activities. Now, if this happened, nobody wants to see any harm come to the bunnies or anything, but it's understandable how people might be annoyed if these rabbits are driving cars around. So somebody may back into a parking space and hit a bunny's car and be really upset with the rabbit who owns the car. They may seek out that bunny and ask a lot of questions like, where did you get enough money to buy a car? And how do you reach the pedals? But the mechanics of bunny driving aside, one might be really annoyed at the very idea of bunnies parking cars where people work, right? This may just be offensive that these bunnies are like taking up parking spaces. Maybe they're parking crooked. Who knows? So this is how the grandiose narcissist really feels about people like the non-narcissist would feel about bunny drivers. The grandiose narcissist views themselves as the only person who is truly human in the sense that they have inherent worth and value. Everyone else is simply an annoyance or something that can help them get their way through manipulation, right? They can manipulate people to get their way. But other people in the minds of the grandiose narcissist really don't have the right to exist on the same plane as the narcissist. So back to this original question, can the grandiose narcissist really experience shame? Maybe some, but largely what we see here is an absence of shame that seems to correspond to the absence of insight. One way of looking at this, a lack of insight may lead to a lack of shame. The grandiose narcissist cannot see themselves as other people would see them. They can only see themselves positively. And if this is the case, there is no mechanism through which they can experience shame. When the narcissist gets into a situation where we would normally expect to see shame, they ask themselves, why isn't everyone else ashamed, right? So they may not be able to experience shame in the same way, but they understand that shame can be experienced because they believe everyone else, again, should be ashamed. Everyone else failed to recognize how great the narcissist is. They failed to admire the narcissist. They failed in so many ways, right? So that's kind of how the narcissist views shame. They don't really have a lot of shame in terms of their own experience of shame, but they understand it and they expect it in others. The grandiose narcissist never looks at themselves as the problem. And really what it's like here is they don't even recognize that's an option. So this kind of reminds me of an Edgar Allan Poe short story called Murders in the Room Work, right? So there was this detective who was kind of being critical of the police work happening like in the story. And this is narrated by a third person who's not the detective. And this narrator says essentially that the police officer's perceptions had been hermetically sealed, like the kind of sealing we see with like medical situations, like bags that would contain something biological, right? So sealed with no chance of something getting in or out. And that, again, is what we see with the grandiose narcissist. The idea that they could be responsible for something is not even a possibility. It never even occurs to them to explore that angle. The construct of shame itself is in a container and hermetically sealed. So with all this in mind, as we try to understand the grandiose narcissist and the experience of shame, all we really need to do is think of bunnies driving cars. So I know whenever I talk about topics like narcissism and shame, there will be a variety of opinions. Please put those opinions and any thoughts in the comment section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. 
As always, I hope you found this description of shame and narcissism to be interesting. Thanks for watching.